Thank you very much. I want to start by expressing my admiration for the work that uh, Robert Van Warren and colleagues who are working with him have been doing over many years. And I'm delighted that this uh, particular meeting is also happening, giving us a chance to get together again and see each other and to see all of you. I've been invited to say a few words about the mental health workforce for the future. And uh, I'll do so, I think, thinking and hoping that uh, there will be other opportunities for us to extend this discussion because to speak uh, uh, from this podium, maybe many of the things that I would have wanted to say, uh, we can't do this uh, straight away. So we'll do it maybe in discussions which I hope will follow. I'm not quite sure how you operate these machines. No, uh, uh, maybe somebody can help me. Ah, this is already, already beginning, yes. So I think that what we want to remember is that the areas of uh, work that compose a mental health program in any country at any time are those that are listed on this slide. You have to think about the treatment of mental uh, illness. You have to support people who have experienced mental illness after they've been uh, uh, having treatment. You have to think about people who support the people who have mental illness, the carers of different descriptions. Uh, you have to think about ways of diminishing stigma uh, of mental illness. Uh, we are also usually writing in that we should do some secondary and some tertiary prevention of mental disorders. Occasionally you will also hear people who will tell you that we should do something about the primary prevention of mental disorders. And finally, we should also do promotion of mental health. And at present, these days, I think what we are seeing as being happening is that there is an uneven uh, support for these uh, various tasks which compose the program classically. Somehow the treatment of mental disorders is being seen as one of the chief uh, tasks that mental health services have to do. Support to uh, people who have experienced mental illness, which is different from treatment of mental illness, it is much more comprehensive, is a second task which we see as important. So treating people with mental illness and supporting these people with mental illness as well. And then thinking about stigma and ways of diminishing stigma, because stigma, after all, and the discrimination, which is the result of stigma, is probably the most terrible obstacle that is be before us if we want to improve mental health of the world. The other uh, tasks which are written here, they support to people who provide care to people with mental disorders, primary prevention and promotion of mental health are a little bit uh, neglected. My uh, topic today is to tell you the time has come to change this and to pay much more attention to these neglected parts of the program that we are having. Uh, I think that we should, we should think about, uh, uh, no? we should think about shifting the priority which we are giving away from what we have now, or at least adding priority to the other region as well, and start thinking about a way, how can we really support people who support people who have mental disorders? Because we are seeing and hearing terrible stories about the ways of the huge proportion of people who have experienced burnout as carers, because they are very often left alone without any support from either the community or from their friends or anybody else and looking after somebody, particularly for people who themselves may have some problems, is an enormous task, very difficult, very essential. I think that we've also neglected until now the primary prevention of mental disorders. And it is a terrible thing to do so because we have once written for the World Health Assembly a document in which we have said that approximately 50% of all mental and neurological disorders are amenable to primary prevention, not to secondary, not to tertiary prevention, but to primary prevention. And then finally, also to do something more about the promotion of mental health. Let me say a few words about each of those three priorities which I believe are the, our task for the future. At present, the support that we are giving to uh, uh, carers uh, is uh, sometimes it is a, uh, some financial support, and then uh, there is this support is usually meager, uh, not particularly, even a little bit is useful, but not as useful as it should be. 
We are also occasionally having the, what, how it's called, the, the courage to give them uh, lectures about how to look after mentally ill, as if they were not the final experts in doing so, having to live with uh, sometimes a person who is not well for 24 hours a day, instead of inviting them to teach us how to do this. We are also giving some empathy, and occasionally they are mentioned as carers need to be looked after as well, we are saying. And uh, the physicians are saying something a little bit about them. And occasionally, we, they provide, occasionally, they get some support from friends. In some organizations, some countries, maybe there are also organizations that bring several of them together, and they are trying to help each other. Now, I think that uh, this uh, has to be replaced, and we have to add things. And the first one is an assessment, is a way of assessing the capacity for care. People who have tremendous amount of problems themselves, financial or others, very often cannot take the extra burden and finally they break down as well as the person whom they looked after breaks down. And there is not a single document in the international literature or anywhere else which says what are the minimal capacities of a family that needs to or can accept a person who is not well into its midst. The only document I've seen is from Holland, there is a uh, journal that is being issued for people and with people who had experience of mental illness. And there was one little article which said that we should really think about defining what are the necess necessary strengths of a family or carers who can take on another person to care. And what do we have to do to strengthen the carer sufficiently to be able to not only look after the person who cares after, but also after themselves? The consequence of this, particularly now reported from care for people with dementia and chronic mental disorders, is a huge epidemic of carer burnout, where the carers simply cannot take it anymore. They want to do it, they are full of heart, they are full of wish, but they can't. It's too much. Because they have problems of their own, the problems of the government, there's a problem of this, there's a problem of that. And in addition, they have and want to give care and help to a person who is there. And there are reflections of this a little bit here and there. In countries in which we have been thinking that uh, care is such a normal part of culture, like for example, the recent law in Bangladesh, which punishes very severely all children who remain simply abandon their elders, their, children, their, their fathers and mothers because they don't want to do it anymore. Or the law that has been passed in China, similar to that. In China, which in Beijing, for example, more than 70% of all widowers over the age of 70 have to hire somebody who will look after them, although they have living children in the same town in which they are living. This is an abandonment of the carer. And I think that that is something very often we say that oh, it's terrible, but it's not necessarily terrible because you think that these people who have and provide care have their own problems as well. And I think we have to agree and think of ways in which we can help the carer sufficiently to be able to live a life worth living as well as provide care to the person who is with them. We should also think of various tools that in some places are happening. For example, the uh, carefree time. That is where a carer is given an opportunity to have a hospital or another facility that will accept a severely ill person for two weeks, not for a disease, but just so that the carer can have a holiday and go away for a fortnight in the course of a year, of several years. Some places this has been done. In many places had not been done. A wonderful example was done in uh, Denmark with mothers of severely retarded children who have been, uh, where an arrangement has been made that the nurse comes once a week and then the mothers are in fact given a free morning because they need a free morning in their life. We should also think about the ways of recognizing the contribution which the carers make. The Royal College of Psychiatrists has an occasion on which at their annual meeting they reward a family who is particularly, a particular model of providing care, but very little. I know of no medical school which is regularly inviting carers to come and help and start and teach in the course of psychiatry on how to look after people with mental illness. They're not invited, they're not respected, they know a great deal. Nobody asks them about what they know. 
and to maintain the morale, maintain the strength, maintain the courage to do on, we need to recognize their role. And not only recognize it by words, but also by deeds, by inviting them, by listening to them, by working together with them in these various things. We have to think of ways in which we are going to increase the physical care for these people. There is an example, a wonderful example from Sri Lanka, where the people who have accepted to care for a person with mental disorder in their home, their physical illness quotient has gone up four times. They suddenly have a variety of physical illnesses, which are normal in many ways, because stress and strain and burden which you are taking affects your health, both physical health and mental health. And we ourselves, I think we should also think a little bit of uh, uh, listening and I think uh, operating and developing our services together with the carers. And we would also have to think a little bit more of other things as well. We should, for example, provide them with adequate financial support because it's incomparably cheaper and much more effective to provide the family with appropriate support rather than to have the result of not supporting carers uh, in hospitals or in various facilities. It's not mental illness which is leading the cost. It's the physical illness which also comes along. I think that we should also think about helping the carer organizations and peer support organizations. The peer support notions, which I think is an admirable development. Uh, I've been very closely uh, related to seeing the peer support for people with diabetes. It has changed their life. And these are people who have generally well recepted. I mean, if you are diabetes, you are probably a very nice man. No? What else would you be if you have a diabetes? You must be in good company to get this diabetes because you have a lot of things to eat. So I think that even in that, nevertheless, the work that has been done by peer supporters in the diabetes has been a marvelous uh, effect. And I think the peer support needs support as well, to uh, at least administrative support, at least some support that they can get. And we should, I think, probably think of updating our legal and administrative changes which can help carers. I have seen very few laws which have this very important thing, which is called the sunset clause, which means that this law is valid today because this is the conditions in which it is brought out. But in two years' time, we have to rule, look back at that law again because that law may not be appropriate anymore. It has, time has gone by, and therefore since the time has gone by, maybe the law needs to be changed as well. And we are seeing obsolete laws in the field of mental health, which are terrible. Nearly three quarters of African countries, uh, French-speaking African countries, rely entirely on the law about mental illness of 1898. And nobody is bothered to change that one. He says, we have a law, when you ask them. Yes, they do, but is it helpful or harmful? Now, this is one of the priorities. The next priority that I mentioned to you I'd like to speak about is the primary prevention of mental disorders. Now, you say primary prevention is not possible, not true. I mentioned a minute ago that we have submitted a document in which this is written. The document is still available, although WHO never bothered to re-quote it, if they could have done so. And because any document to be accepted must be quoted at least 10 times, so repeated many times, so people hear finally about it. But here are some very simple examples. Take the example of the provision of iodine to pregnant women. We have approximately between 6 and 8 million cretins who are born every year because their mother have not been given iodine in time. All right, so that's in some countries where iodine is not being provided. But you could go and think of other ways that where mothers have not been sufficiently helped and because of that had a problem with the childbirth and the problem with the childbirth has then subsequently related into other things. Uh, I'm giving an example very often uh, of uh, the simple things such as the uh, prevention of uh, school dropout and consequences of school dropout. There are about 60 million children in Latin America who drop out of school. And many of them drop out of school because of unrecognized sensory deficit. You think this never happens here? Well, 
our daughter who lives with us in uh, Switzerland, uh, one day her mother, our daughter, has been called and said, would you please come? We would like you to talk uh, and find a person who can look into dyslexia. Your child here is a very nice girl, very pleasant and everything else, but I feel that she has dyslexia. So please, if you can find somebody to consult the dyslexia, especially. Dyslexia especially. Well, uh, you know, we are old-fashioned, and I, we did not see dyslexia in the child, so we didn't believe it. So maybe we should go to an ophthalmologist first. Well, uh, anyway, we, finally we managed to do this. It turned out that he, she has a my hypermetropia of two dioptries. Hypermetropia of two dioptries, which made her almost in, extremely difficult to read. And it hadn't been by accident, she would have gone to a, dys, uh, to a dyslexia specialist, if there is one. And if there is none, she would have finally, because she cannot read properly, drop out of school. And the consequences of drop out of school in all countries are terrible because children are exposed to street risk and to a variety of other problems which otherwise they wouldn't have. And it was in spite of the fact that Switzerland has regular school service, but none of the parents are told that they should also look for hypermetropia. They call about, they speak about myopia. They, they don't see when they are far away. But hypermetropia is very frequent in children. It goes away usually after a few years, after the harm is done. Children very often stop going to school. In Pakistan, a study in which we have done, we found that 20% of the children have minor uh, deafness. Not much, but just sufficient deafness to get the reputation of not wanting to obey when the parents tell you something, of not learning as much as they, not listening to the teacher, and a variety of other things which mildly deaf people have because they don't hear. I'm telling you these simple things because I think that the total gain that we would have if we looked after these things would be enormous, and it's not presently done. I think we should also think about other factors. Michael Rutter, many years ago, has done a wonderful study in which he demonstrated that child mental disorders will grow significantly if four or five factors are present, frequent hospitalization of the child, uh, mental illness of the mother, free criminality of the father. He listed a number of factors. The, these factors are important because they're interchangeable. It doesn't matter which of them is present, but as soon as one is present, your chances that you get mental illness are a little larger. And some of them are corrigible and can be, for example, uh, we've done a survey about five years ago in which we tried to see in which countries of the world are there special programs for children of, mental, of criminal, uh, of people who have committed crime. Who looks out at these children? What happens with those children? They are not guilty for the crime of their father or mother. Some countries have made advances in this respect, but many have not. <coughs> I think that uh, uh, Stunting was another uh, problem, which unfortunately is due to shortage of everything that exists. And the number of children who are stunted goes in hundreds of millions. And these stunted children are likely to develop mental disorders very, very really much more than other children. And many of these stunting consequences can be, in fact, uh, prevented or changed by interventions such as stimulation and meeting people and having meetings and employing them and playing, etc. All things that don't cost all that much money. Now, uh, I think that we should also uh, think about some more efforts in seeing to what an extent we can really intensify primary prevention. First, by working on incomparably more with perinatal care. Perinatal care is an opportunity which is extraordinary because women who are expecting a baby are particularly willing to listen to what people tell them about health and about life and about this, that, and the other. One of the most advanced countries in this respect, you might be surprised to hear, was Mongolia in its time because women who were expecting a baby were taken into a special uh, uh, maternity. In this maternity, they did nothing else, but they had to get courage. And I was amazed, this was many years ago, there was a picture of Angela Davis and Marie Curie, and there were stories were told about these uh, women who have achieved so much, etc. And perinatal care at that time was really to change the image of the woman of herself in a very important aspect. But there are many, many other aspects of perinatal care, and we are rarely utilizing this. I do not know of many places in which perinatal care is regularly shared with a person, a psychologist or a psychiatrist, who could work 
not only with a mother who is full of fear maybe and might have a depression as well, but uh, who is also worried about the child and worried about her husband and everything else. And perhaps it's a point which people are particularly willing to listen, and that is very important. And perinatal care, I think, is an area of particular importance. Parent edu education, another one. Here again, let me go to my family. I have a niece. The niece can't have the children. So they decided they would adopt a child. Well, they, the government said, yes, they will adopt a child, but they have to go to a course. All right, so they went to a course. Six months, they had to pass an exam. Passed an exam, very good. I helped them to, I, I didn't know what they were all learning, but I mean, I, I found my books and I told them. And here they were, they passed the exam. They got the child, everybody's happy. How many normal women have six months training before they have their child. About a thousand things that can go wrong. And it's their first child. They never had another child before. They're... So who helps them to deal with both anxieties, but also with the things that can be done relatively quickly and well and help the life of such a person? I think that another aspect of it is I've seen some miserable schools in which psychologists have been invited to go and work. But these psychologists usually, not, not there must be exceptions, have usually been gone to school psychology because nobody else wanted them. They couldn't get a job in the health service, they couldn't get a job in the uh, rehabilitation service, they didn't know what to, they couldn't get a job in teaching psychology in school. So what happened, what is left, they've been placed in some school and they, they do some undescribable things there. I don't know what they're doing. I mean, occasionally they consult children who come, but the ones that I have seen have not been particularly skilled in thinking about school uh, conditions and the ways in which they have a psychological impact and the ways in which can make this one much better. Now, uh, see, I think that, sorry, I've, No? Yes? Yes. Now, uh, the third area of priority, in addition to the two that I've just mentioned, is the area of uh, promotion of uh, mental health. The promotion, the words promotion of mental health have three senses. There is the first sense, I'm promoting the health, mental health in a community by decreasing the number of people who are mentally unwell. That's one way to do it. The second one could be, it's the sort of a better Mental health is reflected in, in high resilience, better achievement, etc. Very doubtful area. It doesn't seem to work very well. And the third one is the heightening of mental health on the scale of values which people have. How high is mental health on the scale of value of a population? What would they be willing to reject in order to keep mental health? And we know that that's not very high. People, when they ask about what, what about your mental health, they are doing a thousand things knowing it might be harmful to mental health because the mental health for them is not as important as many other things. And changing the position of uh, a family or of a person uh, to really accept that mental health is the one of the, if not the highest value that should be present because it enables you to do everything else is unfortunately not uh, uh, properly done. And this is not as working as well as I would. Uh, now, in order to, uh, to prepare ourselves for a, uh, for a better world, I think we should start thinking about the workforce which will help to do all these things that I mentioned, and perhaps others as well. And I think in order to be prepared for this, I think that we have to start with by revising the way in which future doctors are selected. At present, in many places, they are selected in a simple way by being able to pay for their education. Now, that's not necessarily the best characteristic of a person to have money. Uh, it's something that maybe is not the right thing to do. And we should think of much more uh, attention because not everybody can be a medical doctor. Not everybody. This is not for everybody. You can't learn sufficiently about empathy. It's not learnable. It is, can be, you can be aware of that, but it's not necessarily learnable. So we should select, think ways in which we can select future doctors a little bit more carefully. 
it will be necessary to probably completely revise our undergraduate and postgraduate education. Some of the things to this revision is relatively simple. For example, we could think of ways in which we could spend some of the time of training in which nurses and doctors and specialists and uh, um, assistants, social workers, could be trained together for certain tasks so that they gain some respect of each other while they are learning and not that they grow into a discipline that is separate from all others and hates all other disciplines knowing that they are worse than they are. And it's relatively simple to organize and relatively simple to do. We should, there are many other things that we could do about revising our education. We should probably examine also all of the mental health laws and all of the laws that have a touch on mental illness. We are now, thank God, we are now paying much more attention to the rights of people with mental illness and to ensuring that terrible things don't happen to them. Wonderful, it's a good beginning. But there are many more laws which are very different in nature, but which do contribute uh, to the, uh, for example, the assignment of children in divorcing parents, in divorcing families, and a number of similar things of this type, which are terribly important. We should, I think, introduce training about the promotion of mental health and the ways in which you can change values that people have. This is on one important, on one side important because it deals with stigma, which His Excellency has mentioned. Uh, and I think that you'll hear more about stigma from Professor Tonicroft a bit later. But I think that the, it's one of the aspects in which you can operate with changing values and placing things in a different order. We should think about uh, uh, dropping what is called health education. You know, they think that you should, if somebody comes and calls you in the afternoon and says you must wash your hands before you eat apples. It's, that kind of education is still present in many countries of the world. And it's a wrong kind of education because it separates health behavior from other behavior. It should be an integrated way in which you're teaching people how to live a better life, uh, which is important. And we should undoubtedly remember that most of the prejudice is born and finished by the age of four. Uh, I'm giving an example very often. At the age of four, children understand that animals which are big and small and long and short, and uh, some of them are aggressive and some of them are nice, and all of these animals, provided that they bark, are called dogs. The only thing which unite all dogs in the world is their bark. But it's necessary for a child to understand and to start creating concepts because it has to simplify the world in which it lives. And it's at that point that most of the stigma of mental disorder is done, created. This is be careful of these people. If they behave this way, they are dangerous people. And that four-year-old child or five-year-old child will grow on that beginning of a prejudice, growing more and making this prejudice one of the dom dom domineering parts of it or her life. Now, uh, I think that we should also think of thinking of the way in which we uh, have to start thinking about selecting people in accordance with their personality, in the way in which they are built. We should probably also consider that the capacity for empathy, which can be measured, a sense of justice, uh, acceptance and respect of cultures, of other people, of cultural values, uh, that that should be characteristics which should be important in selecting who would be allowed to be a health worker, nurse, doctor, uh, social worker, any type um, of health worker, anybody who works in the field of health. And we will have to think at the same time while we are producing these excellent people whether the jobs which we are offering them are decent enough so as to enable them or attract them to go to those jobs. And we should make a good job but make it very difficult to get it, which I think would probably change the order of values which we are seeing very often. Now, in addition, I think maybe just a word about psychiatrists of the future. And I think in addition to being trained as all other doctors, uh, they should also be expert users of communication skills, something that is not taught at all in most medical schools. Why communication skills? Because it is more important for a psychiatrist to be able to convince a minister of health that something is important than to know anything else. Because if he is able to communicate and to change people and to lead them, 
it'll be something that will enable him to put good things into practice. And yet, if you look at the, how much training is given for communication skills, practically none. We should also think uh, of psychiatrists becoming able to be real doctors as well, not shy away from a physical illness that a person with a mental illness may have. At present, they are afraid. They, I mean, a person has some kidney disease, oh no, no, I can't treat this, I must, I must find somebody else. No, the psychiatrists have full training in medicine and they should be competent in dealing with comorbidity. Because comorbidity is the rule nowadays, no longer the exception. People are sick from more than one illness and it's not right. At a time when medicine is fragmented into a thousand sub-disciplines, the person is fragmented in many disciplines. So at least the psychiatrist should know what to do about most mental illness and most physical illness at the same time. Of course, they have to be competent in their own field. That goes by its saying, although it's not always done. I think that you should also be able to say, I'm not only doing a treatment of mental illness, but I am also willing to participate in building a life for a person who doesn't have a mental illness anymore. He has it perhaps in the past, but doesn't have it anymore. And he has to think about ways in which that's a different profession, finding places for people to live in a society. It's not just... Uh, giving five milligrams of one drug or another. I think that they should also test themselves and see to what an extent they are willing to work with people who have experienced mental illness, not only work with them, but listen to them actively and saying, oh yes, maybe that's not so. I mean, probably true, let me try that at least. Just develop sufficient uh, uh, receptiveness to be willing to listen and work together with people either who have mental illness themselves or had it, or with people who looked after them. And I think that the word empathy probably is not only referring to the working with a person who is ill. It also refers to people who are around you, to people who work with them, the different categories of staff with whom they work and how they work. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think that the word of tomorrow will bring many, many changes. And most of them we can predict today. There's no problem in predicting the growth of a comorbidity. It's no problem to predict the way in which children will be educated. Many things we can predict today. And I think that the focus of what we are doing and how we are doing should gradually switch. And some basic elements must become much more important, such as is, for example, the need for empathy. I think empathy, not only with people who are ill, but with others around us in a world that is currently getting more and more isolated is a task of enormous importance. We must like and be able to live with other people, whether they are well or unwell, and many of us are not possible and able to do this. And I think that we should uh, look at the variety of effective measures that are now possible and start implementing it one by one rather than waiting for a revolution that will change everything. I think uh, uh, Robert Van Wallen and uh, his organization and many others are leading the way in many of these things and I wish them all the well and I thank you all for your attention.